The UK's negotiator arriving in Brussels for what the government's calling the final throw of the Brexit dice. We worked very hard to try and get a deal. We're going to see what happens in negotiations today and we will be looking forward to meeting our European colleagues later on this afternoon. Thank you very much. The issues that still can't be agreed, none more symbolic than fish. The UK's Environment Secretary repeating the threat. No deal really is an option. Would you be prepared to accept a no-deal Brexit? Of course, we've always been ready for the uh, uh, prospect that we might have to leave the European Union on uh, what we call Australian terms, and that is without a further negotiated outcome. That's been you know, the position of the British government the OBR, from the beginning. The OBR warns that it could cost 300,000 British jobs. You'd be ex prepared to accept the loss of 300,000 British jobs with a no-deal Brexit, because well, it's people's lives and livelihoods at stake here. Well, we've seen these sorts of projections before. What is true is that uh, if tariffs were applied in both directions, that would obviously have significant impacts right. on the EU so, economy. So this... Deal or no deal, overnight there were reports the military might need to fly in COVID vaccines to avoid Brexit congestion. But what behind the scenes has actually changed? Well, Boris Johnson and the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, have sent their negotiators back to the table, saying significant differences still remain, but the talking should continue. A further effort should be undertaken by our negotiating teams. In the last few minutes, a development that could be interpreted as a potential concession. A government official quoted by the FT who says the Prime Minister could still remove the controversial parts of the internal market bill, which would break international law. But from fish to governance to wider trade rules. What's referred to as the level playing field, the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, tweeted his exasperation when things got bogged down last month. He's still looking. With Downing Street briefing this week, they feel it's the EU who's been moving the goalposts. According to the clock, the final whistle is now but moments away. Whatever happens, the countdown will be fraught. If there is a deal, there's still a lot of work to be done. First, the text needs to be checked for legal errors and then translated into each of the EU's other official 23 languages. Finally, it needs approval by both the EU Parliament and then all of the EU's 27 leaders. But the negotiating teams are still at deadlock, and if ever fancy footwork were needed, it is now. Well, Ireland's Foreign Minister Simon Coveney said today that he thought a trade deal was 97 or 98 percent done. But he also rejected the UK government's claim that the EU had hardened its negotiating stance in recent days. I'm joined now by Neil Richmond, European Affairs spokesman from Mr Governor's Fine Gael party. Mr Richmond, where, you, where do you stand in terms of how likely a deal is to be done between that 98% assessment, a 98 assessment from Ireland and the Downing Street's 50-50 chance? Well, I think there are two different analogies there. What the Minister Coveney said this morning is that like, this deal is 98% done. It's that crucial 2% now that seems to be in the balance for the British government whether or not they're, made, they're in a position to make that decision, to get a deal that is in everyone's interest, that's fair and equitable. And we very much hope over the coming hours that Lord Frost and Michelle Barnier will be able to present a text that um, Prime Minister Johnson and President von der Leyen will be able to agree tomorrow night and then go through the ratification process. Well, you tweeted that London needs a dose of reality. Doesn't mm -hmm. the EU also need that? Because if you look at what's on offer, they're offering to hand back just 18% of the fishing quotas, not the 80% that the UK is demanding. And the EU also wants to subsidise industries across the EU without being bound by the same strict rules that they're demanding of the British. So dose of reality on both sides, isn't it? No, not quite, because you think when it gets into fisheries, for example, it has to be quite clear that 70% of the fish that is caught in British waters is sold to European markets anyway. The majority of British, and British flagged ships fishing in British waters are owned by European companies. At the end of the day, how do we identify if fish are British or European, is where they're caught, where they're spawned? So I think there's a fair agreement there. And bear in mind that the British government still want to maintain full access to the world's largest economic bloc in the European single market, including our energy market. When it comes into, I suppose, the level playing field, that's quite straightforward. Anyone who wants to do a trade deal of any sort with the European Union has to sign up with it. It's why it's the world's largest economic bloc. Most of those standards referred to were ones designed by the British government in the first place, 
when they were within the European Union. We need to have that level playing field. We need to have that governance mechanism. And I think that's in everyone's interests. And we want to make sure that we can achieve that in the coming days, because as was stated in your, in your report, the consequences of a no deal for everyone is extremely bad, particularly well, what are the United Kingdom. Well, what are the consequences of a no deal where you, from where you're sitting? Well, I think the first and most worrying thing for everyone is the potential of tariffs and quotas and then the vast majority, the vast of allowance for delays when it comes to transporting goods. It would be terrible for everyone's economy, particularly the Irish economy, particularly the British economy. When you bear in mind that about 50% of our beef is sold into the UK, if the UK are going to apply a 40% tariff onto that, that means British consumers are going to be spending more for on their meat, on their food produce. The UK isn't a net producer of their own food stuffs and many other things. But I think what we really need to look at is that there is a deal on offer. It can be achieved in the next couple of days. It can then put, be put through the ratification processes, both in Brussels and in London, and we can continue to go on. If we look at where we started from, if we look at before the referendum, what was being promised to the British people, the now Prime Minister said that the UK would never countenance leaving the single market. And where we are now, yes, a deal can be delivered. It be a very thin deal, but this is always a damage limitation operation. And just finally and briefly, if the Prime Minister reinstates those clauses which would allow him to override the withdrawal agreement, what are the implications for the peace process? What do you say to him tonight as he's contemplating that? Well, I think the Prime Minister needs to be very aware that the withdrawal agreement is an international agreement and he is bound by their terms. It is an international agreement formed to protect a peace treaty of which the British government is a co-guarantor. Being going leaving the EU in a couple of days' time or a couple of weeks' time and saying to the world that we're prepared to break international law that we negotiated and agreed merely months ago really does set a very bad and worrying example to the rest of the world. Neil Richmond, thanks very much for joining us.